I don't know if I have mold poisoning. I could have um, come from my thermos or humidifier. Um, mold poisoning is, so if you mean mold toxicity, this, so there's, there's two ways you can react to mold. There's being mold allergic. So there's mold allergy, which is not the same thing as mold poisoning. Mold allergy, although you can be allergic to molds the way you could be allergic to ragweed, the way you could be allergic to food, but mold poisoning generally refers to mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are different than mold. Mycotoxins are mold poop. Basically, they're highly toxic, volatile, organic compounds that can poison you. They're poisonous to humans and animals both. And so the way you would know whether or not you have a problem with mold poisoning or mycotoxin poisoning is to test. There are a number of different ways to test for mycotoxins and uh, that's something that you would want to do is check and get with your doctor and check for mycotoxin levels. And if your levels are elevated, now you can, um, now you can dive into where that mold might be coming from. But generally speaking, unless you're eating severe, um, severe like rotten food or very heavy mold contaminated foods, your mycotoxin levels won't be ele elevated enough. Generally where we'll see people with mold poisoning is going to come from environmental mold growing behind the walls or growing you know, in their home. Uh, let's see here. Why does the uh, why does the food industry only think that gluten equals wheat only? Even dietitians seem to think this because they're undereducated. Again, you go back to you know, I mean, it's no offense or affront to anyone who has a dietetic degree, but the training is traditional. In dietetics, you get traditionally trained. And so what does that mean, traditional training? Traditional training is a focus on what are known as macros. So there's a hyper focus on carbs, fats, and proteins. And this is a very simplistic way to look at nutrition. And this is, you know, again, that's that's traditional training. So they're not, they're not going, I'm not to say that they don't study vitamins and minerals and some other things, but it's just not a super in-depth form of training. And so when, again, when it, as it relates to gluten, you know, how many people, if you asked a hundred doctors, what is gluten? How many of them would give you a correct answer? Most of them would give you an incorrect answer because they don't know. Ask the same question of dietitians and most of them, most of them, if they're trained well enough, will tell you this. They'll give you this because this is an acronym that is taught in school, BROW. What does that stand for? Barley, rye, oats, and wheat. So this is an acronym that's taught, in, in, you know, and many diet, dietitians will learn this in their schooling. So if you ask them what gluten is, they'll say it's a protein found in the brow grains. Okay, again, that's just a, a way that helps them remember it. But not all of them remember this. Remember, you have good students and you have bad students. And just because somebody goes on to graduate doesn't make them the equal of somebody else who went on to graduate who is much... Uh, much more aggressive in their learning style and tactics. I mean, not all, not all professionals are equal, right? I'm sure you've all had an experience where you hired a bad plumber, you hired a bad electrician, uh, and then maybe you had to hire a good one to fix the bad one's work. Well, it isn't any different in healthcare. You can hire a bad one too, and so that, that just is what it is. Let's see, what is the gluten in wheat called? The gluten in wheat is called gliadin, G-L-I-A-D-I-N. That's the main glute gluten found in wheat. Is it true that malnutrition in childhood can lead to hypertension in adulthood? I heard that from a PhD nurse. So it's generally not the malnutrition in childhood um, that leads to the problem in adulthood per se. Um, what happens in childhood, so what you did as a kid doesn't have to follow you as an adult, like as a doomsday statement. But generally what we set up as children is we set up habits right? We set up habits as a child and those habits roll into adulthood, right? If you've ever heard the biological argument, nature versus nurture, these habits are something we were taught. They're the nurture we were given. And if they're good habits, when we're adults, we'll be healthy. And if they're bad habits, when we're adults, the, the damage from choices, so let's just do a math equation here. Bad choice multiplied over by time, okay, equals disease. In this case, we're just talking about high blood pressure. 
If you change your choices, even in, as an adult, so you could be an adult and you could have been nurtured improperly as a child and you could have high blood pressure here in adulthood, but you can change your choices, right? So if we say good choices over time equals health, right? So you can change that even in adulthood. And the reason I clarify is I don't want anybody walking away from my show thinking that there's some kind of a, again, there's some kind, just because what you did as a child, you're doomed with that forever. You can make those changes and you can improve your health. Are there really mold and mycotoxins in wheat products? Is that why bread gets moldy after a few weeks? Well, no, I mean, yes, there are molds and mycotoxins in grains, um, wheat included. It's not necessarily why they get moldy after a few weeks. They get moldy after a few weeks is because there's mold, ambient mold in the environment. And so if that stuff is left out, it will start to mold because what does mold eat? Mold eats carbohydrate foods. It really loves grain. It's very easy for mold to, to set up shop and use the, the grain to, to eat as a fuel substrate so that it can replicate and grow stronger. Let's see here. Does Can gluten affect the liver? I think I mentioned that earlier. Okay, so the question specifically, does, does gluten affect the liver and testosterone levels in women? Yes, it can affect. It doesn't have to just affect men. It can also affect women. Can gluten cause peripheral neuropathy but no other major symptoms? Chris asks. Yes, Chris, it sure can. Um, there, gluten has a, there's actually some doctors that believe gluten is actually, gluten sensitivity is a neurological disorder primarily, meaning that gluten can solely manifest in the nervous system creating neuropathy and no other symptoms. Um, can I use goat milk if my body reacts with normal cow's milk? Apparently I'm not reacting to anything with goat milk using now almost three months. You, you can, um, but, but you know, that some people are allergic to goat milk. Some people are sensitive to it. So, I mean, whether or not you are or not, that's something you can get tested for. Goat milk has a different type. Remember earlier I said that milk has a protein that mimics gluten? So we got the name of that protein is casein, but specifically there's a type of casein from most cows uh, in industrial countries. It's called A1 casein. And so what's unique about goat milk is the casein in goat milk is A2, which A2 doesn't tend to, so this one can mimic gluten, A2 does not. And so that's where a lot of people can tolerate the goat, goat rather, or the sheep. Now you can, you know, if you want to buy your own cows, you can actually buy A2 cows. They do exist. I have five of them. Um, and so... That, that is where some people can tolerate dairy okay. It's just the type of dairy that's commercially produced has that specialized casein that can create a problem. So goat and sheep milk, can, can that, that is a potential workaround. But again, many people that do that still react and they still have problems with dairy, not because of casein, not because of casein at all, but because of some of the other proteins that are found in milk, like lactalbumin is, an, is a different type of protein found in milk that some people are allergic to as well. So you can be allergic to the non-casein portion of dairy and do poorly with milk. So it just depends on the individual. Uh, is black rice any good? Black rice, you know, depends. If you're talking about black rice, if it's actual rice, some, now I've seen it mislabeled. So black rice, also sometimes called forbidden rice, is still rice. Now there are some rices that are, um, that are actually, they're a, a form of, um, really the term is wild rice. So wild rice is gluten-free, and sometimes it's mislabeled as black rice. So if you're referring to wild rice, we're okay. Wild rice is technically not a rice at all. It's a, it's a marsh grass. It's a marsh grass. So it's, it's, it's different than, um, than your other rices. Um, so wild rice is, is, is gluten-free, although many people are still allergic to it. It is gluten-free. Can gluten cause you to sweat at night? I'm way past menopause and have really bad tinnitus. Yes, it can. It can cause you to sweat at night, very much so. Uh, other things can too, but gluten definitely can, Michelle. Okay, what are the mold tests? Again, I mentioned mycotoxin testing, so that's you ask your doctor to, you know, there's several mold tests, but mycotoxin testing is an important part of determining whether or not you have a mold issue. I have celiac disease and I'm constantly bloated. Is there anything I can help take to help with that? Yes. So one of the problems with celiac disease 
is when you're trying to recover from years of gluten-induced damage to the GI tract, your digestion doesn't work as well, so the act of eating in and of itself is more challenging because your pancreas isn't secreting enzymes or you've got damage to the GI tract. So digestive enzymes, the one, one of my favorites is Gluten Shield. And this, is, this has a, full, a spectrum of digestive enzymes that help break down gluten, but also help you digest your food. I have another formulation called Ultra Digest. And this is, this is another formulation that, that has additional enzymes in it, for, again, to support digestion. So these two things both might be of help if you're still bloating and you're gluten-free, but I would also suggest make sure you're truly gluten-free and that you're not still getting some of these other grains or grain substitutes that can behave like gluten. Something else that you might consider um, with your, if your digestion is, is, if you're bloating a lot as well, is you might consider an acid supplement. Some people do well with betaine hydrochloride. We have, we have a, a product called Ultra Acid um, with betaine hydrochloride and gentian root and some other things that help support the breakdown uh, of food in the GI tract. So those are all things that you can do. And then one other thing you can do is a good, strong probiotic. Sometimes years of gluten-induced damage alters the microbiome. And when that happens, you can be left wanting with healthy bacteria. And so sometimes it can be a good jump start to support your gut. Flora, taking a probiotic. One of the ones I recommend is Biotic Defense. Uh, it's, it's a strong, uh, it's got about 42 and a half billion colony forming units of, of bifidolactobacillus species in one capsule. So it's a pretty strong dose for one small pill. Uh, let's see here. What causes inflammation and autoimmune disease markers to be missed in blood tests? Lack of diligence on behalf of the doctor. I, would, I, would, I don't know what else you mean by that unless you're talking about false negatives. There are a number of tests that you know, are not perfect. And so many tests that are trying to pick these things up might not pick up. So example, antibody tests. If you're running antibody tests for... Um, you know, for autoimmune disease, you have to pre-qualify running them. And the reason why, antibody tests typically measure IgG, IgM, and IgA. And so, if you're using these tests to try to determine whether you're having an autoimmune reaction, you have to first pre-qualify the, the, whether these tests are valid by understanding whether your IgG, IgM, or IgA levels are normal. So run those at the same time. If you run these at this, ask your doctor, run my total levels of IgG, IgM, and IgA. And, and if the levels are normal, then you validate any kind of antibody test that you're measuring for autoimmune disease. However, let's say you come back and your, you know, your IgG levels are low, and now you're using an antibody test that measures IgG response, it can give you a false negative on that kind of test because if your overall IgG is low, then your specific forms of IgG to different types of bodily tissues might also be low. So again, that, that's something doctors don't often do. They don't, they don't do their diligence on that front side where they pre-qualify the test by knowing what your antibody levels are. Nicola, so what can I eat? Nicola, here's what I want you to do. Um, go to glutenfreesociety.org. At the top in the menu, there's a section that says recipes. And I want you to get, there's over 150 recipes there. Just go there, click that link, and you're gonna get all kinds of ideas about what you can eat. That's where you wanna start. Well, okay, what about chronic granulomatous disease? Yes, chronic granulomatous disease. There is There has been linkage to gluten. Um, in, in research studies, and I've actually seen cases clinically where, where people have improved. Can you throw light on alopecia universalis since it's autoimmune problem? Can it be cured fully? Any protocol since there isn't much info out there? I love that question, Raza. So the answer to your question is, depends on what stage you're in. With, with alopecia to that grade of degree where you've lost all of your body hair, if it's relatively new loss, meaning if, if it's just recently occurred, Oftentimes, I've seen it be reversible. I've seen cases where, where women were bald and grew their hair back. Um, so it is possible, but, but if you let it go on for years and years and years, is it possible to reverse years and years and years worth of damage? I've seen it go both ways. I've seen some people be able to regain some of their hair growth, and I've seen some people not be able to. It just depends on how advanced 
stage the autoimmune, how destroyed those, those hair follicles have become because you can destroy them beyond the point of recovery if you take it too far, if you take it too long. Uh, Cassandra is asking, what about, uh, what would you suggest supplements to support um, abnormal liver enzymes, high ALT in the liver? Um, well, probably one of the, my favorite formulation um, is one I actually put together. It's called Ultra Liver Detox. Um, so that's, that's one you could attempt, Ultra Liver Detox. It's gluten free and it's got a number of ingredients in it, but um, silly marin and milk thistle is one of the major active ingredients as is in acetylcysteine. Both are very critical for supporting liver health and recovery. Um, you know, those of you asking me about specific names of specific lab tests, I just want to let you know, this isn't, this isn't me ignoring your question, but I don't, if I don't agree or like a particular lab, I just, I generally, you know the old saying, if you can't say anything good at all, or if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything good at all. That's just kind of where I'm going to leave that uh, with that question. Um, why would you fast for seven days? <laughs> why would you fast for seven days? I think the, the, the benefit of fasting for many people is their, is their bodies are so overwhelmed by environmental stimuli and chemical stimuli coming through through food. And so fasting can give your body an overall break. And there are times where fasting can be appropriate for seven days. My experience is this though, most people that fast receive a tremendous benefit because they quit eating and they quit eating what they were allergic to. So they stop the damage from coming into the body. And then when they start eating again and they break the fast, um, they pick up where they left off and they're just going right back to damaging their body. So to my, it's, it's kind of the number one, one rule. It's, 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 I call it the number one rule of detox because the fast is a form of detox. But the number one rule of any detox is this right here. Don't retox. And this is where I would never use a fasting strategy if, if I didn't know what I was allergic to, what I was sensitive to. If I didn't know what chemicals exposures I was having that were creating problems, then I, I'm not a big fan of detoxification if you don't know what caused the toxicant uh, overload or overburden in the first place. Now there's common sense things that you can do, like obviously eat organic food, don't expose yourself to pesticides, try to avoid chemical cleaners and other things that we know are just not healthy and not good for you. But some people are allergic to their favorite foods. I've, I mean, I've seen cases of blueberry allergy that were terminal. I've seen cases where broccoli was the problem and where cauliflower was the problem. So again, these are things that are oftentimes part of a detox, right? Some of these juice detoxes where people are juicing a lot of kale or spinach. I've seen that be the case. So the number one rule with detox is don't retox. But the number one rule of not retoxing is knowing what's creating the toxic burden in the first place and that's where just my mind goes to being objective and right and that's through objective measurements so through testing um let's see here vitamin c seems to be the i don't know hold in vitamin maybe that's a typo maybe that's golden vitamin um, for helping everything i'm just assuming i don't want to put words in your mouth shauna um, confused with liposomal or different forms better um, and what dose for teens and female adult. So I, I'm glad you asked the question about liposomal C because liposomals are corn derivative. And this is one of the reasons I don't use them. Liposomal have corn and that's why I don't like them. Now, some of you that don't have a problem with corn um, you know, maybe a different issue, but I just won't use them because our platform is no grain, no pain, and corn is a grain. Um, if you're looking for a good vitamin C, plain old good ascorbate, uh, detox C, which is ascorbic acid. And please don't argue, none of you, leave, don't leave comments about ascorbic acid or ascorbate not being the complete vitamin C that's found in plants. Ascorbate is the Nobel Prize winning nutrient that has been shown to heal and repair. And so I'm not saying there aren't benefits to eating whole food based vitamin C, but if you're trying to get high doses of something in, you're not going to do that through food. You're going to do that through ascorbic acid. And this is where clinically this can be very, very powerful. So if you're taking ascorbic acid, 
Um, you want to have it. You want to make sure it's buffered. And this is why in detox C, you'll see there are minerals that buffer it. We have magnesium and calcium and zinc and potassium that buffer the vitamin C. That's to prevent the acid from basically creating too much acidity and creating an irritation or a problem. So we buffer it for that very reason. Now, as far as quantities. Um, if you're talking about quantities, anywhere from two to five grams a day, if you're trying, if you're, if you're really aiming for higher levels to support yourself, for example, for cold and flu season, you know, that's very, very safe. The great thing about vitamin C is your, your bowel will let you know when you're taking too much. You can take vitamin C to bowel tolerance, and what will happen is you'll get loose bowels. That means you're, you're hitting a point where the, the dose is too high, so you got to back it down. So let's, let me give you an example. Let's say you took five grams today and you were, had loose bowels all day. Back that down to four grams. If the next day you still have loose bowels, back it down to three. And at, at that day, if you don't have loose bowels anymore, three is a good amount for you to be taking. Again, if you're trying to take in as high of a level as is safe for your bowels to tolerate, to, you know, to basically give you support. Uh, can gluten cause bladder and kidney stones? Not really. Um, gluten can affect kidney function. And so let's think about this directly and indirectly. So the kidneys filter your blood, right? And so gl where gluten, gluten can induce um, something called nephropathy, and I, one of the types of nephropathy, which is kidney disease, right? IgA nephropathy, I've seen this be reversed 100% on a gluten-free diet in a number of people. Um, and so in that regard, gluten can dismantle or, or reduce kidney function. Now, what causes kidney stones typically is vitamin D deficiency. So low levels of vitamin D combined with oxalate too much oxalate in the diet combined with dehydration, like kidney stones, it's not just one thing, right? It's kind of a, usually it's a, it's a conglomeration of different things. Now, sometimes oxalates can be high because people have a yeast overgrowth. So if you have a yeast overgrowth, that can actually, gluten can sometimes trigger yeast overgrowth. That can lead to increase in oxalates. If you're also vitamin D deficient and you also don't get adequate fluid and you also have gluten-induced nephropathy, then yeah, gluten can cause, through all that roundabout way, can cause an increased risk for the development of stones. That's if we're talking about oxalate stones. There are different types of kidney stones, though. There, there's struvite stones, there's oxalate stones. So it's not always, uh, it, it just, I hope that explains it well to you because there are nuances there we don't really have time to get into all the depths of. But yes, it, it can indirectly. Let's see here. Should I repopulate the gut microbiome after extended water and electrolyte fast? I was looking at biotic defense. You know, it depends. I mean, you can, you can, you can. A fast doesn't necessarily depopulate the gut microbiome. So, I mean, that if you're, you know, if you're thinking, if you're under the assumption that fasting somehow de depletes the gut microbiome, there's a lot of research that actually shows that fasting improves the balance of the gut microbiome. So if you wanted to come back and take a probiotic, you can, but you may not need to. Can gluten cause Meniere's disease? Yes, it can. Uh, that is one of the neurological manifestations of gluten. Can gluten cause damage to the eye nerves and cause intraocular blood pressure and dry eye and loss of vision? I have seen it. I have seen gluten damage the nerves to the eye. The, 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 um, the, you know, the cranial nerve that feeds the eye. Absolutely, I've seen that be the case. Now, as far as dry eye is concerned, there's a lot of, I mean, I don't, I, I want to be just real cautious to say, yes, it can, but so can other things. I guess that's maybe where I want to go with that. I don't want you all to get the impression that gluten causes everything and nothing else can cause anything. I, I want you to get the impression that if you struggle with an unknown diagnosis of unknown cause or unknown origin that your doctor's trying to medicate and nobody's ever asked whether or not gluten is playing a role and that condition is an autoimmune condition, you need to ask the question about gluten. Um, should we be more concerned about gluten contamination or glyphosate or both? Both. I think both. It's, it's super important, especially if you know you're gluten sensitive. Um, how best to help with asthma problems? Depends. Um, asthma has multiple different 
causes, but gluten can be one. So one great way to help asthma problems if you're gluten sensitive is to not eat gluten. Um, what are my thoughts on colostrum for healing the gut? Do you have a product with colostrum? I do. I like colostrum. Um, there, but some people are really super sensitive. And even though technically colostrum, colostrum is derived from dairy. Um, but even though the, the purified versions of colostrum don't have detectable dairy allergenic proteins, some people that are ultra sensitive to dairy don't do as well with colostrum. So I have a product that is non-dairy called Immune Shield. Um, and then I also have a product that is dairy-based colostrum called Ultra Immune IgG. And so let me just make sure you can read that right. So Ultra Immune IgG and Immune Shield. This is a, this is a bovine serum product. So it's blood-based, whereas this is dairy-based. So um, both of these um, are good options, but depending on whether or not you're allergic to dairy, one might be a better option for you. Let's see. What's the minimum carb should I take with with hypothyroidism? So that's a that's kind of a loaded question, Vic, because it's it's you know how tall are you? How much do you weigh? Um, what are your goals for your weight? Like that, that's just a, it's a loaded question because there's not enough details there for me to give you an accurate answer. There's not a minimum quantity of carbohydrates. I would just say if we're generalizing as a whole, look for equality in your diet. Most people are, are wrong. They go too far abreast. And, and so we look for what I call the rule of thirds. So no matter what you're eating, no matter how many calories you eat, strive for equality between carbs, fats, and protein. Unless you're be, you've been put specifically on a ketogenic diet, where where you generally where your fat goes much higher, your protein goes higher, but your carbohydrates gets down to anywhere you know anywhere 10% or less of your total caloric intake. But you know there there are very few people that absolutely need to be on a ketogenic diet. Some of them are on on them therapeutically for diseases like epilepsy or other neurological disorders or diabetes management. So um, just depends. But start with equality in your diet as opposed to starting with, um, with, with radical shifts. Food intolerance results in gas buildup, always requires considerable burping. Do you know of any other solutions to relieve this quicker? Um, yeah, if you're, if you're struggling when you eat, if you get gas buildup every time, I mean, take a digestive enzyme and take possibly even an acid, an, an acid support supplement to help with your digestion, and that might help you navigate those intolerances. Remember, intolerance is not the same thing as allergy, more so intolerance is, is when you don't digest something very well. So taking supplements that support digestion oftentimes are very helpful. Uh, Maxine's asking about reliable testing to determine food allergies. Maxine, there's a lot of them. There are a lot of different ones. There's not one test because there's six different ways the immune system can react to food when you're trying to determine food allergy and food sensitivity. So it's, it's multiple different types of tests. We're working on a solution for, um, I, I, I say the, you know, generally in my practice, you know, people come to me from all over the world and they want to get tested and that's what we do. And we're working on a solution for people who maybe want to do it through online, but we don't have that ready yet. And when that's ready, we'll make a big announcement and we'll explain all about it and, and what it means and what it looks like. But right now we just aren't there. Um, Heart palpitations after eating gluten? Yes, that can happen. That's a that's a, a common thing with gluten. I've seen, I can't tell you how many times I've seen heart palpitations just completely go away with the proper diet. Uh, Mark is asking about organic corn tortillas. Yeah, you can eat them, but if you're gluten sensitive, they're not gluten free, no matter what the label reads. The label can read gluten free all at once, but corn contains, even organic corn contains zane, which is definitely a gluten based protein. So Gina, I have SIBO with constipation, training very hard to find, or uh, I don't know, training very hard to find a way of getting my bowel working on suggestions, please. To get your bowel working again, um, 
Yeah, if you're reading my book, No Grain, No Pain, and applying the 30-day protocol, that's really, that's the best place to start. Beyond that, um, you got to make sure that you're sleeping well, that you're exercising and moving your lower torso, because sometimes people have gut problems for lack of mo movement and lack of mobility. It's very important to move the body so that it functions, especially so that your GI tract functions properly. If broccoli gives me lots of gas, does it mean it's bad for me? It means that you're not digesting it well. So one of the ways that you can, I mean, broccoli is a cruciferous vegetable and like all cruciferous, they are gaseous forming. And one of the ways you can reduce that is you can cook them very well. A lot of people try to eat them raw and that can be a mistake for some. So cook that broccoli till it's soft, like steam it until it's soft. It still retains its nutritional value, but it'll be a lot easier on your GI tract to digest and a lot, a lot less gaseous forming. Let's go down on the left side. Cheryl says, my eye doctor diagnosed me with epithelial basement membrane dystrophy uh, and epiretinal membrane of the left eye. Could that be caused by gluten? I, you know, I don't know. I, I haven't seen that particular condition or read anything about that, that particular type of eye illness, could it be associated with gluten? Possibly. I mean, I would say where, you know, I don't know about the autoimmune response, but I would say that the gluten-induced malnutrition could definitely affect the way that your eye is capable of regenerating. And so that is a potential possibility, but whether or not it's exactly gluten taking, it looks like you're already on a gluten-free diet and you still have the condition. So probably isn't going to be directly gluten-related. Can you recommend how to, uh, Increase white blood cell, uh, increase white blood cells and neutrophils, mine are below 0.5. Um, gosh, Shauna, that, so with that, that's a big, that's a monster of a question. Um, white blood cells are made in your bone marrow. So I would just say, if you're looking for something simple to support blood cell production. So just, all right, here's my long bone. Inside your long bone, you've got marrow and inside the marrow, you have what are called stem cells, okay? And these stem cells are precursors to your red blood cells, to your white blood cells, but also to your platelets. And if you're trying to stimulate bone marrow to grow, um, one of the things that can cause neutropenia, and which is low neutrophil count and low white blood cells, is folate, which is vitamin B9 and vitamin B12. When these two are low, oftentimes this can drop. And so again, it doesn't mean that that's what's happening with you. There are other reasons, but this is a real simple nutritional experiment you can do. Now, I would suggest that you follow up with your doctor and a hematologist and rule out any of the other major diseases that might impact or affect your bone marrow in a negative way that could be you know, quite dangerous illnesses. But the, nutritionally, this is one great way to help support stem cell production of your blood elements. And so that, that would be something that you can start there. I see that quite a bit in, in people that come to me where their B12 and folate are quite low and they've got this long history of low, low blood counts. And uh, we see them come up with that. Sometimes too, what can improve white blood cell counts, so since we're talking about it, is, is supplementally is L-glutamine. L-glutamine is the primary fuel source. So it, it's the fuel source for your white blood cells. And so not having adequate L-glutamine can contribute to low counts as well. Um, gosh, the questions haven't stopped and we're running out of time. I think we already did. What's the best way to heal the damage from celiac? The best way, Jennifer, in my experience, is no grain, no pain. So if you've, if you've not read it, get a copy from the library or, or pick up a copy at Barnes & Noble or Amazon and apply it. Um, that's the quickest way to really start recovering from celiac-based damage because it goes deeper than just a gluten-free diet, which, you know, if you talk to your GI doc, you know that they... It generally, they don't go to any great depth at all. Um, and a lot of times the information they give you is, is harmful to yourself and you don't even realize it because again, you didn't, you didn't know this information. So no grain, no pain is a great place to start. Let's go down on both sides. We'll knock a few more of these questions out. Um, Melissa's asking about lung disease and mycotoxins. Yes, you can develop lung illnesses as a result of mold exposure. No doubt about it. There's actually a 
a dangerous uh, condition that where aspergillus molds can settle in your lungs, creating aspergillosis, which can be very, very challenging to overcome. Uh, let's see here. Can I take vitamin C if I have problems with too much oxalate? Yes, but you, you, you know, depending on, on why you have too much problems with oxalate. So there's some people that, that, that believe that too much vitamin C can actually exacerbate oxalate. That is a very, very rare thing indeed. It doesn't happen very often at all. So it's very, very rare. So I just don't want to discourage people from using vitamin C if they suspect oxalate. Um, sugar, does it cause the same reactions as gluten or wheat? It can, depending on the person. I mean, I, I get pe people all the time that are allergic to sugar. I mean, we actually, we literally test them for sugar allergies, sugar sensitivity, and find that they are. As far as sugar substitutes, stevia, um, stevia is okay, provided it doesn't have any other fillers in it. What you have to be careful of are the alcohol sweeteners, like erythritol, can be corn-derived. Um, but... Um, there are some, like xylitol can be birch wood derived, and that's actually, in my opinion, one of the better options is birch wood xylitol. Okay, let's go down just a little bit on that right side. Well, I did. So Aaron wants to know if I'll do a video on schizophrenia. Sure. Yeah. I mean, bread madness. That's what it is, right? Schizophrenia, is, uh, his original name was bread madness. It's definitely a disease linked to gluten sensitivity. And, um, you know, probably one of the smartest, smartest docs I've ever had the pleasure of reading is Abram Hoffer. And he do goes into deep onto schizophrenia and vitamin B3 and vitamin C as, as therapeutic options for, the, for that condition. Um, is gluten-free buckwheat safe if it comes from a true gluten-free source? I don't recommend it. Um, I don't recommend it for several reasons. One of the reasons is molecular mimicry. Uh, a lot of people react to it that are gluten sensitive, even if it comes from a great source. So wouldn't, wouldn't recommend it, um, especially if you're still struggling with any type of health issue. Okay, I think we've got lots more questions, but I ran out of time tonight, and I'm going to go home and eat dinner, and uh, you guys should too, and I hope this was helpful, and if you're new to the gluten-free diet and you're new to uh, the possibilities of what, it, what you can experience in your health with a change in your diet, and, uh, and this is your first time hearing any of this information, like don't leave this show tonight and walk away like overwhelmed and confused. Come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org. Make sure you sign up there for our free newsletter. I'll send you a bunch of free stuff and information that will get you moving in the right direction. And I want to encourage all of you, if you haven't yet, sign up for the Glutenology Master Class. We go 14 hours deep and do everything you could imagine possible about gluten. So I want to make sure you know that's a resource that costs you nothing that you can access. We're going to do that class in September. 15th through the 19th. So make sure you go sign up. We've got to put that link up for you. And uh, thanks to all of you for the wonderful birthday wishes. I appreciate it. I'm celebrating 49. That's why I wanted to give you 49 ways that gluten could cause damage or create a problem for you. So thanks for sharing tonight with me. And we'll see you next Monday night for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Take care. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, Make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.